All right, so part two, we're starting with anatomical position of the body. Um, and letter A has the axial region of the body, the appendicular region. So axial region of the body is gonna be anything in the central axis. So everything that falls in this bracket here, the head, the torso is the axial portion of the body. And then your appendages, right? If you think about um, what an appendage is, it's something attached to a main region. So those are your arms and legs. So this is your upper um, appendage, or we call it the upper extremity. This is your lower appendage or lower extremity. So we have our axial region in the bracket and the appendage, the appendicular region in the brackets. Your skeletal system is arranged this way and your muscular system is arranged this way. So the, there's axial muscles that are found in the central axis and then there's the appendicular muscles. Um, same thing with bones. All right, so what about supine and prone? If you're a supine position, that means you're laying down on your back, right? So that means that you're on your back. And if you're in a prone position, that means that you're on your stomach. And one interesting thing that came out was the people who are having trouble breathing with coronavirus infections is that they are not... Um, they're, they're having trouble when they're in a supine position on their back breathing because your lungs, when they expand, they expand in a 360 degree um, direction, right? It's all around your body. So most of your lung mass is actually on the sides and on the back. Most of your lung mass is not in the front because you have your heart that takes up some space. You have other organs um, sort of traveling in the center of your chest. So because most of your lungs are inflating backwards into the side, if you're laying on your back, you're not allowing for that inflation to happen. So that's why the um, prone position is actually the better position for those who are having trouble ventilating or breathing. All right, so moving on to the other terms here. Directional terms, letter B. So the terms, when you talk about like the, the relationship between parts of your body or an organ itself, um, you want to use these anatomical terms. And you, so we're going to be using these all semester. These are uh, words that you need to get used to hearing. Um, so we'll start with the first one. So anterior and ventral. So anterior and ventral refer to anything towards the front of your body. So you can say your umbilical um, umbilicus, which is your belly button, is on the anterior surface of your body or ventral surface of the body. You can say the trapezius is a posterior muscle, for those of you who know where the trapezius is, or the lats is a posterior or dorsal muscle. So dorsal and um, posterior mean the same thing, anterior ventral mean the same thing, so you can in use them interchangeably, you're correct um, either way. And so it just means front and back. Um, post, okay, so they're opposites, medial and lateral. So medial is a term used for something that is closer to the midline. So the midline of the body is an imaginary line that goes down the center of your axial region, right? So that's your mid, mid, so that's your midline. So anything that's closer to the midline is medial. Anything further away from the midline is called lateral. So let's look at the anatomical position again. Notice the thumbs, right? The thumbs are pointing outward. So I need to point that out. The thumbs here, Pay special attention, right? Anatomical position means that your palms are facing forward. Your, everything else is pretty much standard. You're standing straight, your legs are straight, your feet are pointing forward. But the palms do face forward in anatomical position. So we would say that the thumbs are lateral, right? The most lateral digit because they are the furthest away from the midline. And we would say the digit five or your pinky is your most medial digit because it's the one closest to the midline. All right, we can also talk about the eyes and nose. So the eyes, how are the eyes in relationship with the nose? The eyes are located a little bit further away from the midline. Remember that midline goes right through the body. So you would say the eyes are lateral to the nose. The nose is medial to the eyes, right? Because it's closer to the midline. Okay, so those are those two. So um, let me just pause because I realized I forgot to talk about what is your leg and what is your arm. In anatomy, your leg, I know that when we talk about our leg, we really mean everything that's in the bracket here. We would say that this is your leg, but in anatomy, it's actually not. The leg is only from the knee down. So this is your leg. The, from the knee to the ankle is your leg. Then what do we call this structure here? That is your thigh, okay? So um, 
when we talk about muscles and what muscles move, there are muscles that move the thigh and there's also muscles that move the leg, different muscles. How about this structure up here? What we would consider our arm, if we were not in anatomy class, is actually all not your arm. So the arm is technically from your shoulder to the elbow. That is your arm. And then this is your forearm. And again, muscles that move the arm do not necessarily move the forearm. Okay, so just so we get that clear. Back to anatomical terms. Superior and inferior. Superior or cranial, inferior or caudal. So that's basically above and below, right? So superior or cephalic is towards the head. The word cranial is something that is used as well. So cephalic or cranial towards the head. Caudal is or inferior is below. Here's inferior below, right? So we could say something like your um, chin is superior. Well, let's actually do the nose is superior to the chin, right? Because it's above. So that's above and below. Then we have the words superficial and deep, which is actually not on this picture here, but superficial, I'll write it out. The word superficial means, as it would mean in common language, it means something that's only on the surface, right? So it's on the surface or it's very close to the surface, towards the surface. But deep is opposite. Deep is something that's found below the surface, okay? So we would use these terms like the skin is your most superficial um, organ of the body, the muscles are deep to the skin, we could say your the fat, right? If we actually just look at the skin, the most superficial layer of the skin is the epidermis. Deep to that would be the dermis, okay? So it's just kind of a towards the surface or below the surface. All right, now let's look at proximal and distal. This is something to really highlight. Notice this purple, right? So here and here, we're talking about the upper extremity and lower extremity. So upper extremity is what we call the, what you would say call the arm, right? But we just said that it's actually arm and forearm. So the safe term to use for this is the upper, we can use upper limb, that's a shorter one. Upper limb or upper extremity. This is your lower limb, right? Or lower extremity. Those are co the common terms for that. But proximal and distal are used only for your extremities. So you only use these words when you're talking about these parts of the body because what proximal means is towards the trunk, like it's closer to the attachment of your trunk. And what distal means is it's further away from the trunk. So let's compare something like your ankle and your knee, right? Your ankle is what to the knee? Your ankle is farther away from your trunk. So your ankle is distal to the knee. Or you could say the knee, which is closer to the trunk, the knee is proximal to the ankle. It's just like this relative term. If you had a bone, okay, so we're gonna go into bones a little bit uh, later. Um, let's just draw something like the humerus. I am not an artist, so, but I can kind of draw the humerus here. So the, um, the humerus has this rounded part and that fits into your shoulder socket. And then this part is gonna to be towards your elbow. So we would call this is the proximal end of the bone, right? Because it's at the shoulder, it's closer to the attachment of the trunk. And we would call the part at your elbow, this is the distal part of the bone. So when you have a bone and it fits on your body a certain way, the part of the bone that is closer to the trunk is called the proximal region, right? And then the distal region. So when we talk about bones, we'll probably, I'll be using those terms about the appendicular bones. All right, now let's talk about the words central and peripheral, which are not on this picture, but central means in the center. 
So something like your um, central nervous system, which is abbreviated CNS, the central nervous system is in the middle of your body. The central nervous system is your brain and also the spinal cord. So there's your brain and then your spinal cord comes down like this, right? So that, those two things are in the central part of your body, hence the name central nervous system. Peripheral nervous system, right? The, perif the word periphery means outside the center. So your peripheral vision, for example, is anything outside the center of what you're looking at. <clears throat> so those are the terms central and peripheral. And then ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsilateral means the same side and contralateral means the opposite side. So we could say that your left hand and your right hand are contralateral to each other because they're on opposite sides. We can say your left foot and your left hand are ipsilateral to each other because they're on the same side. Okay, so that's all it means. Opposite side, same side. So this is a little um, example of some questions that you could be asked on an exam or a quiz. So you can go ahead and pause it right now and see how you do filling it out yourself. Um, but I'm going to go over the answers at this moment. So the esophagus is what to the stomach, right? The esophagus is actually located above the stomach. So this would be superior. Okay. The ears and the nose, so the ears are outside um, and the nose is smack dab in the middle. So the best word that would fit here are the ears are lateral. Okay. The shoulder and the hand. So this is, uh, remember this is your upper limb. So we want to use proximal and distal. The shoulder is closer to the trunk. So the shoulder is proximal to the hand. Okay. The lungs and the spine. So it turns out that the lungs are in front of the spinal cord. And so we would say that the lungs are anterior. The chin and the mouth. So again, this up down, um, superior versus inferior, but the chin is actually underneath the mouth, so we're going to say inferior. The sternum and the shoulders. The sternum is located in the middle of your chest. The shoulders are on the sides, so the sternum is in the middle, which is medial. Um, when you're comparing two things in terms of like the midline, right? The sternum is medial to the shoulders. The fingers and the wrist. This is the fingers again. Here's another limb. Right, so the fingers are further away from the trunk than the wrist is, so we want to use the word distal here. The spinal cord is located in the what portion of the body? Central. If you said dorsal, that's okay. Sometimes you have a couple of answers that would fit just fine. Um, the muscles are what to the skin? So the muscles are underneath the skin, the muscles are deep to the skin. The skin is what to the subcutaneous fat, so the skin's on top or superficial to that. And what, this is a blank here, you guys. Your what vision sees movement outside the direct area of focus, and that would be your peripheral. I didn't have any room to write peripheral, but peripheral vision. Okay, so that's, those are some examples of the, how you would use the terms or see the, a question about these terms. All right, so let's move on and talk about regions of the body. So on your first test, um, you're going to be, um, you're gonna to have to know all of these terms. You're gonna to have to know uh, this picture here, as well as the bottom half of the body on the anterior side. This is the superior dorsal side and the inferior dorsal side, okay? So all of these four images, you wanna to commit to memory and this is not just for one test. This is, these are terms that you'll see over and over through the whole semester. So um, you're not learning it just for one test. I know it's a lot of terms here. Let me just explain a couple things here. So the word in bold, buca or services, or cheek, right, or neck. This is the noun. This is the noun. But you can also say this is the buccal part of my body. This is an adjective. So when you say buccal, you have to say buccal what? Buccal region, buccal part, right? Because it, it's like saying pretty, pretty what? Pretty part, pretty face. So buccal, buccal region, or buccal part, okay? Um, so you can see maybe we can um, find something that's a little bit more uh, familiar. Let's look at nose, right? So we know the nose is the nose, 
we know the anatomical is nasus, okay, or nasal. You wouldn't say this is my nasal, like this is my nose. You would say that's my nasal region, okay? So nasal is for the whole region. Um, so you want to know everything. You want to know the noun, and you also want to know the adjective because you don't know what you'll see on the test if you're not familiar with one or the other. Um, just be aware that they're all um, something that you should be, recognize. Be careful in a couple areas here. The, there are some little switches. So I'll show you the antibrachium, the anterior forearm, okay, or your forearm or antibrachial region is actually a different word than the back of your forearm. If you look at the back here, is it back here? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. So I meant here, antecubitus, I'm sorry. They're front of the elbow. So the antecubital region, the front of the elbow, is different than the back of the elbow, which is your olecranal region. Okay, that's where I should be. Um, another thing to realize is the back of the knee and the front of the knee. So that's another flip. So the patella is the front of the knee, or the patella region, and the back of the knee changes name to popliteus. Another switch is the back of the calf, which is called the sura or sural region, and the front of the calf is called the crural region. Okay, so those are the only places where you have a big flip, um, so be aware of that. And then the other thing to sort of put in your mind is that the fingers, um, your fingers are numbered. The first one, your thumb, is digit one, two, three, four, five. So digit one has a different name than two, three, four, five. So two, three, four, five are just called digits. But your thumb is called the pollux, okay? And the same thing for the feet. The feet, the big toe has a special name, the hollux, and then two, three, four, five is the toes or phalanges, okay? So just wanted to point out a couple of things like that. Um, but I think that's all there is to point out. So you just have to commit these terms to memory and be aware that th these terms will be on your first exam. Okay, so which of the following corresponds to the arm? So I, I know that you haven't had this yet, but if you look at these terms, a lot of these are sort of familiar maybe. So the word pedal, which is actually pronounced pedal, is the foot, right? So like you have pedals on your bicycle. So that's actually the region of your foot. Femoral, if you know what your femur is, a lot of you guys might already know what the femur is, it's your thigh bone. So the femoral region is the thigh, okay? So these, these words, they're not trying to trick you, they're actually trying to help you. Then we have the word brachial and cervical. So cervical, if you guys um, have heard of your cervical spine, right? The cervical spine is in the neck. So this actually refers to the neck and then the, the vertebrae in your neck are the cervical vertebrae. And the word brachial is now for the arm. And later on, we'll learn all kinds of things that have the word brachial in it. Your brachial nerve, your brachial artery, your brachial vein. So the word brachial is anything that runs through that part, that arm. Remember the arm is from the shoulder to the elbow, right? That's your arm. Um, but anyways, so you'll see that these terms will come up over and over and over again. And um, they'll be very useful once you learn them in this chapter one you'll um, be better off for the rest of the chapters. Now, the popliteal region is blank to the patellar region of the body. So now this is a good question because I can see that I'm asking you two things. I'm asking you, do you know your regions? And I'm also asking you, do you know your um, directional terms, right? So just so, because I know you're starting off, the popliteal region is the back of the knee. This is the back of the knee is what to the patellar region, the patellar region is the front of my knee, okay? So what do you think is the best term to use here? So if you said dorsal, you're correct. The back of the knee is on the back or behind, right? Dorsal to the patellar region. All right, so moving on to our body cavities, um, or sec I'm sorry, sections and planes, letter B. So we're looking at here um, three different kinds of planes. So anytime you see images in the textbook, you're going to see a, a section. So it's going to be cut. 
whether it's the heart that's cut a certain way or if it's the whole body or the brain, but there are sections that you want to be aware of. So sections or planes, right? So let's talk about the sagittal. So the sagittal plane is something that is going to bisect um, a organ or the body and divide it into left and right portions. You can go down the middle of something and go down and make exact the same size left and right portions, and that's called mid-sagittal. Or if you're off the midline, right, that's called parasagittal. So this picture here is off the midline, so this would be a parasagittal section, right, parasagittal plane. It's still dividing that whole person into left and right portions, but just not equally. So that's sagittal. Then number two, the transverse or horizontal plane. Look what's going on here in this picture. So you have a plane going through this body. It's dividing the body into superior and inferior portions, right? Superior and inferior portions. And then the frontal or coronal plane is going to cut the body or divide the body or organ, of course, into our anterior and posterior portions, okay? Oblique sections are going to run at a diagonal. So anything that comes in at a diagonal is going to be oblique. It doesn't matter what diagonal you're talking about. It could be something like that or like this or like this. But um, oblique is for any diagonal. So if you notice the planes we just talked about, frontal plane, transverse plane, and sagittal plane, they're all at right angles to each other. Okay, and so that's um, the terms you want to get used to. Let's look at, this is name that plane. So this is just, your choices are again, sagittal, transverse, and frontal. So this one looks like it's cutting the body in half, but it's cut the body in half down the midline of the body. Um, and I think that looks, this looks like a right or a left side. And so this one would be a sagittal plane, right? All right, let's move to this one. So what plane is this? Well, this looks like it's going through someone's abdomen. And in that same way that we looked at the MRI. So what plane are we looking at here? This is going to be called transverse. Okay, a transverse or a horizontal plane. And just if you guys are curious, we're looking at a portion of the abdomen that is going through your forearms. So if you're standing up in anatomical position, your forearms, you have two bones in your forearms, which are these bones that you can see here. Okay, and then uh, so your two arms are resting at your side and then you're looking at sort of something below the belly button or from the belly button down, right? All right, and then this plane finally, this is gonna, oops, sorry, this is a frontal plane. Right, we're getting that entire frontal slice of the body. So this image, uh, these are I think all from Body Worlds, uh, these images. Okay, <clears throat> so now we have our sectional planes and visualization. So this is talking about the, what the term I have in the outlines, longitudinal section versus cross section. When we go into looking at histology slides, you the the tissue it'll say whether that tissue was cut when you're whether you're looking at a longitudinal section or a cross section of a hollow tube, a hollow organ. So something like this guy here, this could be a piece of intestine, it could be a blood vessel, anything that's long and hollow. It could be cilia, something that's, it could be um, an elongated structure that curves. Depending on where you slice it, right, you can have an image, you can have all these different images depending on how you caught, like at what moment did you cut into this curved, let's say, intestine. If you are cutting through it, here where it's mostly on the long, this would be the more longitudinal section. So you're catching most of that opening. You'll have this kind of image here. But if I am catching this, the short span, the short width of the, the diameter, then this is a cross section. Okay. So it just depends on where you're catching that. I have another picture for you here, right? So this is cross section versus longitudinal section. Both of these images is pretty much the same thing. It's gonna be a tube, 
Okay, so this is what you're looking at, it's a tube. You can cut the tube in this way where you see a circle, right? You're gonna see kind of a circular structure and that would be this. So the tube is lined with cells. So the cells would be here, right? They're lining the, the tube. This area where my X is is the hollow region. This is the hollow region right here. So this is a cross section. Okay, you're getting the short diameter of the image of the structure. Then this one here is the same thing except we're cutting it lengthwise. So if we're going down the length or the long axis of the structure, we're going to get this image because we're going to see the cells on that line this structure here. I'm just drawing these rectangular cells. And then the hollow area, this, is going to be here, right? So you're looking at a different view. Same thing, just different views. So I just want to make sure you guys know that. Um, let's go ahead and introduce a word here. The space that I put my X's in, when you have a hollow organ, such as a blood vessel, intestines, stomach, um, bladder, whatever the hollow organ is, even, even like a... Um, a sweat gland, like a tiny, tiny sweat gland has a, a duct in it. The space is called the lumen, okay? The lumen of a duct or the lumen of your stomach, the lumen of your small intestines, that's that space that you have in a hollow organ. Okay, just wanna introduce that to you. Moving on. All right, so what plane, a plane that passes perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the body. So pause to think about it. All right, so if you thought about it and you're kind of, you're a little confused with the question, what is the longitudinal axis of the body? So if we have a body, right, very long torso I drew, the longitudinal axis just means the long way. So that would be cutting the body in this. So this is the longitudinal axis. And then if you wanted to identify a plane that passes perpendicular to that, that would be a plane that goes like this, right? So we're perpendicular to the longitudinal axis, and the question is asking you for that plane, which is a transverse plane. All right, so this is body cavities and membranes. So we're looking at letter C on the second page of your outline. So your body is divided into um, cavities. So when we develop and vertebrates develop, there are spaces of your body that are filled with organs. And then sometimes there is a physical divide that cuts off the space from another space and sometimes not. So let's take a look at the cavities that we have in our body. And by the way, the reason why we have cavities is so that our organs are able to move and change shape. So if you were to house every organ inside of its own unit, it might not be able to stretch and move and to, you know, to change shape or to enlarge. Um, but if you have a, a larger cavity with, you know, organs in it, then those organs have the freedom to sort of move past one another slightly um, when you're moving your body and you're doing things like gymnastics or yoga or, in, you know, anything, you have some freedom to move. And also your organs can change shape. So if you, after a big meal, your stomach gets bigger, a woman who's pregnant is gonna have a giant uterus compared to a woman who's not pregnant, but you need to accommodate that change. All right, so let's take a look at our first cavity. So um, I'm gonna start with dorsal cavity. I know that your outline, this is gonna be number two on your outline just because dorsal cavity is much easier. This is the one in yellow. So the dorsal cavity is gonna be everything in yellow. Okay, so this is dorsal. So it just means back, right? Dorsal cavity is the posterior or back cavity. And the cranial region, the cranial cavity is here. And what viscera? So if I ask you what viscera lies in each cavity, viscera means soft tissue or organ. Basically organ, really, right? So what organ lies in the cranial cavity? And of course you would say brain. And then the cranial cavity is connected to the vertebral cavity. So the vertebral cavity, there's no just, there's no um, structure that runs through the cranial and vertebral cavity to separate them. They're actually one, it's one continuous cavity, right? So if I ask you what viscera lies there, well, obviously that would be the spinal cord. Okay, so that's the dorsal cavity, pretty easy. 
Now that's separate from the ventral cavity. The ventral cavity is in red and the ventral cavity is huge so it's subdivided. Um, there is the thoracic cavity here okay and then the abdominal pelvic cavity here and they're divided by a structure here. So this structure I'm really filling in here that's the division between the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavity. That is the diaphragm, our breathing muscle. One of our deep breathing muscles, the main breathing muscle we have. Okay, so that's your diaphragm. So let's look at this in a different way. So let's take a look at our ventral cavity. And here we see the diaphragm, right? So this is our diaphragm that really divides our thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity is everything above the diaphragm. Everything below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity. Then let's take a look at the thoracic cavity. It's subdivided even more. So what we see here are two on the side here and here. Those are for the lungs. And so those are called pleural cavities because the word pleura, P-L-E-U-R-A, is going to refer to lungs, okay? Then we have something called the mediastinum. And so everything in the middle, so what you see here, I'm going to box it out, okay? So this area here, this is your mediastinum. The mediastinum is also subdivided. There's a, another compartment here. And this compartment that I'm filling in, this is your pericardial cavity, okay? So the mediastinum contains the pericardial cavity. So what viscera is inside your pericardial cavity? Well, obviously that would be the heart. You already know the lungs are inside your pleural cavities. And then what else is here? So the mediastinum, what we have here in this upper part, is several things. So for example, you would find your esophagus moving down from your, your upper throat down to your stomach. You would find that there. You'd also find your thyroid gland here. You'd find different structures, large blood vessels, your aorta, superior vena cava, things like that. Um, so anyhow, that, that's the mediastinum. So the mediastinum includes the heart, okay? Um, and then you have the lungs and, and you have um, those subdivisions. Now let's look at the abdominal pelvic cavity. This is also called the peritoneal cavity. And notice that it's just one big open cavity except it's darker in color here. And this is the pelvic region. So there's no physical divide. Um, all the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity are in the same space, but they, you sort of like um, think about the organs in the pelvic bowl. So between the hip bones, this is your pelvic cavity, okay? So if I asked you what viscera lies in the pelvic region or the pelvic cavity, right? So what could we find here? We would find things like here, right? So actually in this picture, the pelvic cavity is tiny, tiny. You would find your bladder, you'd find your reproductive organs, your, for, so for women, it'd be the uterus. For men, it would be the prostate gland and seminal glands. Um, the last portion of the digestive tract, namely the rectum, you'd find there. And then everything else you can think of is in this larger abdominal cavity. So this is all your digestive organs, your small intestine, large intestine, most of your large intestines, your liver, your spleen, your stomach, your gallbladder, your pancreas, kidneys. These are all here. Okay. Um, and then you can see how they, this is also subdivided. Okay. So this is a really nice um, picture to study. And then moving on to the question here. So body cavities are, let me pause it to think about it, and it's letter D, all the above. So ventral space, this is the same thing as cavity. So if that threw you, the word is cavity. Okay. Now we're going to look at the um, subdivision. So if we look at number one, the four quadrants, you can divide your body into, um, you can divide your abdominal cavity into four, okay? Um, when you do this, oh, I drew two lines here. That's not what I wanted to do, but. Uh, so here's your belly button. Ignore this right here. Uh, so we can just simply say upper um, right, lower right, 
upper left, lower left, okay? So we can say that, and we can say like, oh, you know, if you're a triage nurse, this person's coming in with very severe pain, but in the upper left region. So this is like where you have a lot of, this, it's just sort of spread out, you can't really pinpoint a specific spot. If you can become more um, specific, then you wanna use these words, okay? So this is something, this grid is what you wanna memorize for the first test, these different regions. And so, um, for example, your appendix, if you're having appendicitis, then you would have a lot of pain in this right inguinal region because um, that's where your appendix is. Um, so anyways, the inguinal region here, inguinal, this is where the groin is. So this, this region here on either side would make sense to be the groin. The umbilical region is named after your belly button. Epigastric is above the stomach. Your stomach is actually is within this box. Uh, the hypogastric just means below the stomach. Um, lumbar means lower back. So this region, actually, if you, if you go and you spin this person around, you would say their lower back. This is at the same level. And then the word hypochondriac is really strange because the word chondra refers to cartilage. Um, and the cartilage of your ribs is actually within this region. So there's a lot of cartilage connecting your ribs to uh, the sternum. So your sternum would be right here. So the cartilage here and cartilage here means that this region is underneath the cartilage. Okay, so hypochondriac, it's a strange word, but it means below the ribs. But I'm sorry, it means below the cartilage. All right, so this is another way of looking at your grid. So you can place some organs in the grid. And then let's take a look at our next topic, which is our membranes. Before we go to membranes, just a reminder that these terms we're using, the hypochondriac region, the lumbar region, um, our directional terms, these are all meant so that all professionals, healthcare professionals can speak the same language because we don't wanna do tummy ache, what does that really mean? INSI, what does INSI really mean, right? We wanna measure things in real numbers. Um, way down inside, you know, you don't wanna use vague terms because it's hard to deliver information from one hospital to the other, from one healthcare practitioner to another. Okay, so moving on to our last topic, which is our membranes. Um, right, so your body, the cavities we just talked about, um, not all of them, but there are some cavities that are lined with something called a serous membrane, and so they're called serous cavities. The serous membrane is a double membrane that has um, two layers. If you look at this example of a balloon, the fist would represent the organ and uh, the balloon represents the membrane. So it's a double layered membrane. This outer layer of the balloon would be called the parietal layer of the membrane, parietal. And then the inner membrane that touches the fist, so remember the fist is an organ, that's viscera. So we call that the visceral layer, okay? And then the air between them will have um, fluid, okay? So let's take a look at our serous cavities. There's three of them, okay? So we have our pleural cavities of the lungs, we have our pericardial cavity with the heart, and we have the um, what's called the peritoneal cavity of your abdominal pelvic cavity, your abdominal pelvic region. So when we use, when we look at the lung, we just want to use the word pleura, so we know we're talking about the lungs. The parietal pleura, the word parietal means on the wall. So you can see that this is pointing to the outermost um, layer of that membrane, which is attached to the cavity itself, right? It's attached to the wall of that cavity. Then you have the visceral pleura, which is going to be the layer that's on the lung itself. And then between the two, you're going to have fluid. And that fluid is going to help to reduce the friction of that moving organ. So think about your lungs. They're getting bigger and smaller every time you inhale and exhale. So they, these are constantly in motion in order to not harm or rub or cause any friction on that delicate lung tissue. You have all this fluid that reduces the friction. So if you look at their number two on your outline, the serous fluid is produced by the membranes itself. It reduces the friction between the two membranes and allows the viscera to move and change shape easily, okay? So that's what the fluid's doing here. 
So the fluid, you can call that pleural fluid. In the heart, same thing, parietal pericardium. We want to use the word pericardium because now we're talking about the heart. Is going to be the membrane that's on the wall of the cavity. Parietal, sorry, visceral pericardium is on the heart itself. And then between the two, we're going to have pericardial fluid. If you look at the um, our last picture here, letter D, we have our visceral peritoneum. This is going to be the membrane that's on the organ itself. So this is our liver. This is our organ. You can see over here how the line is pointing to that layer that's on the organ. And then we have the parietal peritoneum, which is going to be on the outer part. So you can point here for parietal peritoneum or what it's doing, it's pointing to this outer red line there. Okay. And then of course, between them, you can have peritoneal fluid, right? So that your abdominal organs can change shape. All right. So um, we've covered everything. Let's see if I have another question for you. The lining of the lungs cavity is called the Pause, think about it. Okay, so we're lining the lung, the lung's cavity. So we're not lining the lung itself, we're lining the cavity of the lung. So we want to look for a vis, oh sorry, the cavity is parietal, so we want to look for parietal, and we all want to look for the word for lung, which is pleura. So parietal pleura. Congratulations if you got that right. And we're end that is the end of lecture one.